Okay, well, I think um, we will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Rhonda Heights. I'm a parent resource coordinator at the Monroe Meyer Institute. And um, we are going to be facilitating um, this uh, presentation this evening. Um, my coworker, Jennifer Hansen, will be taking your questions in the chat. Um, you all, if you had registered before noon um, this, today, um, you should have received an email with the slides attached. So, um, and there was some information about how to use the chat if you weren't familiar, but down at the bottom, there is a feature that says um, a, the chat box. Um, and that's where you can go ahead and type in your questions and Jennifer will be monitoring that and then um, asking those to the um, presenters, just because, again, um, we have so many people that are participating in this um, presentation that we wanna make sure we're not talking over each other and making it difficult to hear. So um, with that, I will go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for coming this, and, and joining us this evening. Um, we know that there's a lot of crazy things that are going on. We thought this would be something that might still be helpful and useful for families. Again, like I said, my name is Rhonda Heights. I'm a parent resource coordinator at MMI. Um, can everybody see my slides okay? Yeah, okay, great. Oops. So we first just want to welcome you to the information series. Um, basically, we just wanted to, we kept hearing from families that, you know, um, it, it, there is a way to kind of get more information out to a broader number of people as to um, disability-related services and how to navigate those programs and um, kind of facilitate getting connected. Um, so we thought this was a great way to do that, and so we piloted um, this program last fall, and so now we've opened it up into more of a webinar-type um, series for the spring. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, as I said before, please submit all of your um, questions through the chat. Um, if you wouldn't mind, please keeping your um, microphone on mute, just so that way, um, again, we don't talk over each other. And we are recording this um, session, um, so um, just also kind of keep that in mind as well. Um, at the end of the presentation, we do have a very short, like four question, um, a survey that we would like just to get some feedback from you and from the participants and families to make sure that we're providing, first of all, information that's helpful, second of all, that we're covering the topics that you would like to know most about. So if there's other suggestions or other things, either email me, but there, um, if you wouldn't mind taking that um, survey at the very end, that really helps us kind of um, modify and make any changes and make sure we're giving you the best information and the most helpful information um, possible. We have two upcoming series, um, sessions, excuse me. After this one, May 12th, we have Guardianship and Alternatives with Marla Fisher-Lemke. Um, she's from the Office of Public Guardian. Um, and also we're planning to do um, a session on education supports. We're still working out some of the details for that, but there is a link as well if you'd like to register for that, um, just to have that taken care of and on your calendar already. So tonight, we are very fortunate to have two presenters to discuss with us social security disability. The first is Josette Bright, um, who is also a parent resource coordinator here at um, the Monroe Meyer Institute. She also has worked um, for social security in the past um, as someone who helps determine eligibility. And we also have Shauna Dahlgren from Easter Seals, who works a lot with families, um, getting them um, kind of understanding the, the whole social security process and how um, working affects that and kind of managing their benefits. So um, that's um, who we are going to have visiting with us tonight. Um, my contact information, if you have any questions after this, please feel free to either give me a call or um, drop me um, an email. And um, with that, we will go ahead and get started. So I think first we have Josette. Welcome, everybody. So glad that you're here. Um, as Rhonda said, I'm Josep Bright. I'm a parent resource coordinator here at Monroe Meyer Institute. Um, for those that don't know, parent resource coordinators are parents of children with disabilities um, that assist other parents and family members that have children with disabilities and chronic health care needs and, and connect them with community resources. Um, they offer support. So, um, Happy to be a part of Monroe Meyer Institute. 
Um, as Rhonda said, um, I was a previous disability examiner for the state of Nebraska for about four, over four years. So my presentation is going to be about the application process and some hints from a medical examiner's point of view. There'll be some little tidbits about some changes since um, COVID-19 has come around that I know about, that I've gotten from the website and um, some other information. So let's get started. Go ahead. And so here is our agenda for tonight. Um, we'll do the, just a brief overview of the application process, requirements for children and adults, where you can where you can apply what happens after applying and what happens after your child is found eligible for benefits and then just managing your child's benefits and what if um, your child's case is denied so next slide so disability requirements for children and when i say children children that are younger than 18 you're not married and have a medical determinal term, term oh, I'm sorry, determinable physical or mental impairment that affects the child's daily activities. So um, when they look at disability for children, it's not based on their their work, their the ability to work as they do for adults. It's how it affects their daily lives at home. And at school. So the child's condition must be disabling for at least 12 months or the condition must be expected to result in death. Next slide. So some there are some qualifying conditions that a child may automatically qualify for and those are some of the conditions there. Um, total blindness, total deafness, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, muscular dystrophy, severe intellectual disability, symptomatic HIV infection, birth weight below two pounds, 10 ounces, um, infants from birth to one, failure to thrive in infants and toddlers. So at 18, they look at a child differently. By Social Security, they consider a child at 18 an adult. So adult disability rules apply. So at that time, income and resources of the family are not counted unless this person has a spouse. So, and then if your child is already receiving disability, they have to do a review to see if disability still applies. Sometimes parents are kind of um, dismayed by that, like, well, they're getting disability already, why should we have to go through this again? So this, this, is, this is why. Next slide, please. So the requirements for adults are a little different and they're based on 18 and older. And they look at if the, the person is unable to work because of a medical condition and is in, expected to last at least 12 months or result in death and not receiving benefits, or they could be, like I said, if they were previously, have not been denied disability benefits in the last 60 days, and they meet certain earning requirements if they have worked. So um, income and resources criteria for children. Um, like I had mentioned before, income and resources of family members and child living in the same household are counted. So a child who isn't blind must not earn more than $1,260 a month. And then a child who is blind must not be earning more than $2,110. So, and then income resources for 18 and older, like I had mentioned, um, it's based on their income, it's not based on the family. So the chances of a, a person being eligible for disability is probably a little bit better when the child is 18 and older. 
So if you have tried in the past and you have been un unsuccessful because of income guidelines of your family, you may want to try again and see if you can just base it on your child's income if they are 18. So how do you apply? Where do you apply? It's a little different now because of COVID. They have closed the Social Security Administration offices so you cannot go down there and apply in person. However, you can, you can apply over the phone. Um, I've helped families um, in my work apply over the phone. The wait time is not really that bad as I, it used to be. They've done really much better with the wait times. Um, you could do online if the, the child is 18 years old or older. You could do it by mail, though that takes longer, but you could do it that way. They have applications online that you can print. So, um, like I mentioned, all the, the offices are closed right now. They recommend if you need to do online services to use them first. To, and those are the some of the things that you can do online. And then if you have questions and you're not sure where to look, then they ask you to call the Social Security office. So. So what information do you need to apply? So for children, they require medical and school information from the last 12 months, um, names of doctors they've received for treatment, um, where they've gone to school, the name of the school, name of the teachers, name of special ed teachers, um, proof of income and resources for the child and family, original or certified copy of the birth certificate. If your child was born in another country, you'll need proof of US citizenship or legal re residency. Names and social security numbers of all the children and adults who live in the household. If you are a guardian, guardianship, guardianship papers will be necessary. And then there is a child disability report. You can do that by paper or um, you can complete that online. So what information is needed for adults? Of course, your social security number, dates and place of birth. If, if born out of the, outside of the US, um, a permanent resident card number is needed you're not a resident, U.S. citizen. Um, names, address, phone numbers of doctors, caseworkers, hospitals, um, clinics, anywhere you've been treated um, within the last 12 months. If, the, if your child has worked even part-time, uh, work history is important. You'll need that information as well. List of medical conditions. Education and training, um, including the high school, highest school completed, any special education, any vocational training, um, direct deposit information if there is any, and then alternate contact information so you have a way to get a hold of you. Uh, so we have a couple questions in the chat box. We can take a look at those. Um, I have a question. It says, when an adult on SSI receives a stimulus check of $1,200, how does it affect the resource limit so it doesn't affect future periods? That's a good question. Um, let me get back with you on that. I do have some information about that, but let me, let me get to, to you at the end of the presentation, I can give you a little bit more information. And then there's another one, is how do we submit original birth certificates and other items while the offices are closed? 
I believe that I read that you can submit copies. Um, I would submit a copy versus mailing the original, um, just in case um, something would happen to it in the mail. But you can mail the information. Um, you may be able to scan it into the system as well, but um, well, if it's a child's application, you can't do it online, but you could mail it. Um, there's another one. What types of medical conditions qualify and do not qualify? Could you share some examples? Um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there are some examples that um, automatically qualify or more likely to qualify, like um, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, um, intellectual disabilities. Um, Total blindness, total deafness, um, any severe disability. They do have a list there as well on their website. Um, and they look how severe it is, um, what kinds of treatment the child has been getting. Um, they look at if there's been improvement since treatment. Um, Sometimes there have been cases that I've known, like a child may have Down syndrome, and the reason why they don't qualify for services is because the parents make too much inf make too much money. That's that's a possibility. So, um, oh, Holly has an answer to the question about the stimulus money. She said it does not impact SSI. Um, and PTI does have some information on clarifying that situation. Um, there is information on the Social Security Administration about the stimulus money. Um, so if you have more information, I can look that up for you if you want. Um, let's see, yes, there are mental illnesses that do qualify um, intellectual disabilities um, do qualify. There are children with ADHD that may qualify. Um, there, there are quite a few, but it depends on how severe that child's condition is and how it affects their daily life at home and at school. See, we have another question in regard to resources for HHS. It will not count for 12 months for meeting. Not sure what that question is or what that comment is. Okay, it says what things would be considered as qualifiers for kids with ADHD? Well, they will look at, like I mentioned, um, they would look at how the child, um, how he does in sc school. So are they able to attend? Um, does medication, how does the me medication work with the child? Um, how do they, how are their behaviors at home? They look at all those kinds of things. Um, it just, it depends on a case by case basis. How long have they had that condition? When they, when were they, um, when were they diagnosed? Who diagnosed them? Um, they look at the medical records. Um, if medical records are not, um, suffice or does not give a clear picture, as I'll mention in an upcoming slide, um, they will send this child to a psychological evaluation.
So we'll go on to the next slide and we'll answer some more questions here towards the end. So what happens next? So once you submit your application, the information is sent to the local disability determination services office and it's reviewed by a doctor, psychologist, or trained examiners. And then additional information be, might be sent for if they feel that more information is needed. They do send um, questionnaires to parents and school teachers, um, getting their input of how the child functions at school and at home. So it's really important to uh, fill those documents out and get those back to the examiners. Um, parents are welcome to follow up with the teacher to make sure that they've got them. It's really important to specify the name of the school and the teacher that your child has worked with because it's very hard for an examiner to figure out who your child teacher is. So please specify that on your application. That'll help them a lot. Um, and then if, like I mentioned before, if a de determination cannot be made on the information in the file that they have gathered, they will schedule a medical or psychological evaluation. Social Security will pay for that. Um, that's done by a doctor that has been contracted with the Social Security Administration that has been trained how to do these evaluations. Um, it's very important to attend the exam. Um, failure to attend an exam could lead in denial of the case. Um, right now, it's um, looking a little different on how this is being done right now. I was told by a fellow examiner that um, they are not scheduling these due to COVID um, at this time, so it, it may make the case a little bit longer. But they did say that if you have a, say you have a primary doctor that does very good thorough exams, um, perhaps they could do that for you. But I don't believe uh, the Social Security Administration would be able to pay for that. But I don't know that for sure, but I would think um, that would be upon the person's, you know, it would be up to you to pay for that exam. But that could speed up your case. It could move things along. So it's just something to consider. So... And then always there's that question, how long will this process take? It is a lengthy process. Um, it may be taking longer now um, because of the COVID and how they are processing cases right now. And if your child is needing a examination, um, that may take a little while. Um, it is important, um, that I learned as an examiner that if you have a change of address or phone number, um, or if your child condition, child's condition worsens or maybe something else happens, that it's important that you let the social security know as soon as you can. It can cause delays in the case. Um, it makes it hard for an examiner to get a hold of you. Um, if they are needing more information or they're trying to contact you. So it's really important to let them know of any changes. So once your child is eligible for benefits, um, a representative payee must be appointed by the Social Security. Um, reason for this is by law, minor children are legally incompetent adults and they require a representative payee. So the main duties of a payee is to use the benefits to pay the current and future needs of the disabled child or adult. Now, I did put on there that you must apply in person at your local security office. That may look 
different now. I'm not sure how they're doing that now. I could not find information today on how that's being done, but I can find out for you if you want. And so here, this kind of talks about the duties of a representative payee. And it just, um, like I said, it, you may, um, it's up to you to determine the needs and use the payments to meet those needs of your child. So um, part of your job is to make sure that your child is getting treatment for their medical condition when it's necessary. Otherwise, they may choose a different representative payee for your child. Um, you can save money left over in an interest-bearing account. Um, you need to keep track of records of payments received and how they were spent. They do have some reporting requirements. Um, report any changes or events that would affect the benefits um, eligibility, beneficiary eligibility or payments, and then return any payments if um, the beneficiary is not entitled or you are no longer the representative. Question. Um, do you have to have guardianship to be a uh, payee? Um, no, you do not. You do not. You can be a parent. Um, if the if there is a guardianship, I'm not. I would say you could be the payee as well, but I you don't have to have guardianship. Okay, let me just. I'll answer more questions in just a moment. Um, so, one way to do this. You can manage your child benefits by opening a checking account, which easily creates a record of how money is spent. So um, just title the bank account so it's clear that that account belongs to your child. Use it for current needs such as food, shelter, clothing, dental care, any reasonable foreseeable needs. So, Every so often, there will be a disability review for your child. And this is just to determine whether or not your ch child still meets disability requirements. Um, right now, during COVID, they are suspending that, so you would continue to get payments. Um, they have reprioritized caseloads, so this is not one that is is a priority but once COVID is over just know that um, at least every three years for younger children younger than 18 who whose conditions are expected to improve um, reviews are for babies who are at low birth weight to see if they they are improving and thriving and at age 18 like I had mentioned before when they reach an adult um, they will have a review. So let's, so if, if the case is denied, um, you are notified by mail. You do have an ability to make an appeal, but you have like 60 days after receiving notice to file any appeal. You can do this online. Um, and there's four levels to the appeal process. Um, the first one is called a reconsideration. So, um, what this is, is that this case is reconsidered. It's given to a new examiner, a new set of eyes to review the evidence. And they all look for things like, you know, if there's any missing evidence, any new conditions, um, do they agree or disagree with that 
that decision that was made. And then there's a hearing by an administrative law judge. Um, this is something that can be done within 75 miles of your home. A video hearing can be scheduled. They're doing more of those right now. Do, well, they're doing telephone. They may be doing video due to COVID. Um, it's your advantage to attend. You and your representative should come and explain the case. And then an administrative law judge will question you and what any witnesses that you bring, um, you or your representative may question uh, witnesses. And then there is a review by the appeals council. It's a council that looks at all requests for review, but they may deny a request of it if they believe the decision was correct. Um, appeals council may be made may decide the case itself or return it to the administration law judge for further review. So you'll get a letter explaining that decision. And then there's the federal court. That's the highest, highest point you can go. And then if you dis disagree with the appeals council decision, they decide not to review your case, you may file a lawsuit in federal court. So here are some just some, some other health care services for children um, that you could tap into. Um, I won't go all through those, um, but those are there. And then um, the last two slides are helpful. Um, Social Security Disability Resources for Children. There is a starter kit that helps you gather information um, for your interview, um, it's very helpful. And then there is a booklet explaining explaining the process. That's very helpful. Um, and then there is that disability form um, that you can fill out. Um, and then the next one is for the adults. There's an adult disability starter kit. And then there is a booklet explaining the process and things that you need to know. And then there is a printable application as well that you can print off if you would prefer to mail your application in. It may just be helpful to fill out as you get ready for your interview as well. It's a little more detailed than um, the starter kit, but um, it's whatever you prefer. So I'll and then there's the information for the Social Security Administration Office. Um, so we can go into the chat box and see what kinds of questions you have. I know I, I probably have missed some. Um, one of the questions is what should we expect if our child qualifies for SSI? Okay, so, um, and I'm not sure what exactly you're getting out, but um, you will receive notification as mentioned before, you will get payments um, based on the parent's income and um, you'll get monthly payments. Um, and then depending on the child's um, disability will depend on how often their case is reviewed to make sure that they are meeting their requirements. And do they get Medicaid then when they? Yes, they will get Medicaid. They will qualify for Medicaid. Medicaid often will want a disability determination before Medicaid is approved. They want to see how much they're going to get in disability. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if we should wait for questions till the end. I don't know if, if Shauna's um, presentation will kind of go over some of these maybe. So um, do that. Okay. Shana wants to. Thank you, Josette. Thank you so much for sharing that. 
Um, Shauna, are you ready? Sure. <laughs> um, okay. I'm not let, let me go ahead. I'm going to share the, um, get the share going again here. Depending on the questions, um, they might be, they may or may not be answered um, in my presentation because I'm going to talk more specifically about what to expect after people um, are eligible for benefits and most specifically about just the idea that work is possible um, and some of the work incentives and things that go along with the different benefit programs. Um, so I can't tell on here. I'm new to Zoom, so I apologize for not being able to navigate it a little bit better, everybody. Um, I'm not sure what time it is, but I'm going to ask Jennifer um, to keep me on track if you just send me a message or type into the chat box or something when we only have about 15 minutes remaining. We're, we're actually really good on time right now. Good? It's 7 okay. out of 9, um, okay. it's, and we have till 8.30, so Perfect. there you go. Perfect. Um, okay, so um, I will take questions during the presentation, Jennifer, if you see something that's really relevant to what we're talking about at the time, just go ahead and let me know. Okay. Um, but, or if necessary, we can just take a break here and there to kind of respond to some questions that have come in. Sounds instead good. of waiting until the total end, but we'll be available for questions at the end as well. Okay, so um, I just really want to thank everybody from Monroe Myers first for um, setting this up and helping us navigate doing this um, in this kind of time frame <laughs> um, and through the Zoom meeting so that we could still get some good information out to everybody. Um, so again, I'm just going to talk a little bit about social security disability, that work is possible. And if you go to the next slide, Rhonda, um, this is kind of just a general overview about what we're gonna talk about. Um, many of you may know the terms SSDI and SSI, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that actually means. And then once people are eligible for those types of benefits as adults, and as Josette said, it's for individuals who are 18 or older. So even though the age of majority in Nebraska is 19, Social Security considers people an adult at age 18. So that's when they look at adult rules, that's when the work incentives and everything apply for adults. Okay, so if you look at the two different programs um, on the slides here, Social Security Disability Insurance or Title II is what you think about when you think about the trust fund. So when you hear Social Security talk about the trust fund and where benefits are paid out of, these are individuals who have paid into Social Security because they've worked. They may still be young, but they have actually worked and paid into FICA, so they've paid into Social Security and Medicare, and they have insured status. And once an individual is insured, it insures the worker, that worker's widow or widower, and then also the worker's disabled adult child. And so that's when you hear about people that may actually receive a benefit off of a parent's record instead of their own. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that too. And then social security disability comes with Medicare after a 24 month waiting period. And then supplemental security income or SSI is general tax dollars. So where social security disability is more like an entitlement because you've paid for it, SSI is for individuals who are young, maybe haven't had the opportunity to work, maybe haven't worked in a long time, or for whatever reason are not insured through the trust fund. So this is a needs-based program for individuals who are aged, blind, or disabled, have limited income and resources. And that means very limited income and resources. And then SSI does come with Medicaid, there really is no waiting period for Medicaid, but a person does have to apply, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And just to put it out there, SSI is always the payer of last resort. So if that child has any other income, then SSI can be reduced, or it may mean that that child is not eligible, or even that adult is not eligible for SSI. Okay, and that's where your 
talking earlier, Josette was talking about how parents' income and resources can prevent someone from being eligible for a cash payment. That's kind of where that comes in, or a spouse, or something like that. And Josette did talk a little bit earlier about the definition of disability for an adult and how it is different for adults versus children. So I'm not going to go into it too much, but just again for people to remember that when someone is eligible for SSI as a child, that medical determination is not the same for an adult, which is why Josette was talking about having to go through a redetermination type process to be determined eligible as an adult. And the definition for an adult is specifically related to work and a person's ability to maintain what they call substantial gainful activity. We'll talk more about that. But essentially, even if a person has not been working, so if a child has just turned 18, Social Security is still looking at and needs information to make a medical determination that it specifically relates to that child or that individual's ability to get work and maintain work at a substantial level. Okay, next slide. All right, so once a person is eligible, has met the medical eligibility, is receiving Social Security, or SSI cash payments. If they're thinking about work um, or they're actually working, then some of the things that we often hear from individuals or parents or anybody who is concerned about that individual's ability to work and the effect on benefits are lots of different things that may or may not be um, entirely accurate. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about if people go to work, they're going to lose their SSDI or SSI check as soon as they go to work. They might think that they're not going to be able to keep Medicaid, which means they can't keep their developmental disability services or something like that. They might think that they'll lose their benefits and never be able to get them back. There's just lots of different things that people are thinking or concerns that people have, and they're justified. Certainly, they're justified concerns, um, but you just want to make sure that people have truly accurate and complete information before making decisions about work, especially crisis decisions that may or may not be based on accurate information. So that's what we really try to work against essentially. So if you go to the next slide. What we really like people to know is that there are services out there that help people navigate those systems and even help people understand and have complete and accurate information about the implications of work. Because work really is possible. In fact, most people can work and can work substantially and still maintain the benefits that they need, okay? And so we talk about benefits planning services as kind of an umbrella term, depending on who, what other providers or what agencies you might work with, you might hear terms like, benefits analysis, benefits assessment, benefits orientation. You might hear different terms like that, especially if you're working with like vocational rehabilitation or, or some other agencies. But in general, we use kind of an umbrella term called benefits planning services, which really mean they're individualized services that talk about specifically that individual's situation and the implications of work, the work incentives that are available, and how they apply to that particular person's situation. Not only in benefits planning services, when you think about that sort of broad term and benefits planners who are providing those services, um, which we'll get to in a little bit, um, we're talking not only about Social Security disability and SSI benefits, but also Medicare, Medicaid, SNAP, energy assistance, VA benefits, workers' comp, literally just about any federal, state, or local benefit a person receives, that is all encompassed or all considered when we're providing benefits planning services to individuals. Okay, so instead of contacting Social Security to find out about Medicaid or contacting DHHS to find out about Social Security disability or housing, um, they have enough to know about their own programs. It's hard for them to keep track and 
<laughs> just know how to navigate their own systems. Um, that benefits planners really try to be one place that help individuals and families and parents sort of navigate all of those pieces and put them together for an individual. So Shauna, I have a question here. Yes, um, somebody said, um, could you repeat the different um, terms again, planner, analysis, and what other ways might I hear benefits planner? Okay, um, so when I'm talking about benefits planning right now, I'm kind of using it as an umbrella term. If somebody is, um, even within Easter Seals, let's say, we have some different programs um, that provide benefits planning services, but depending on who our partners are um, within that program, there might be pieces of benefits planning that are referred to differently. So for instance, um, we have a couple of different um, contracts with Social Security Administration. So they use particular terms as far as like information and referral or benefit summary and analysis um, and some of those kinds of things. We also are a partner with Nebraska VR. So if somebody has an active case with Nebraska VR and are referred to Easter Seals for services, then they have very specific types of services at specific points in the process with Voc Rehab, which you might hear benefits assessment, which is sort of an initial introduction. Um, they also do an orientation. They're within the VR offices, there are benefit specialists that do benefits orientations with individuals and families. Um, once somebody is working, then you might hear the term benefit summary and analysis. That's a more thorough report. So I guess it's not necessarily important to, um, to know exactly all of the terms and what those mean. I just wanted to make the point that benefits planning is sort of an overall umbrella term and depending on how people receive those services, um, especially if they're receiving them through Easter Seals, either directly through Easter Seals or through referral from one of our partner agencies, there may be some different terms that identify particular pieces of that. Um, so hopefully that answers their <laughs> question. So I think um, another clarifying question, um, could you define substantial gainful activity when you talk about SSA, a definition of disability adult? Yes, um, I will say real quickly that substantial gainful activity is a particular amount that Social Security looks at, one, to determine eligibility for um, the medical eligibility for either SSDI or SSI, and then they also look at it for continuing eligibility for SSDI folks. Um, but I will talk more specifically about amounts and stuff in just a few slides when we're talking about um, the work incentives and everything, okay? Um, okay, so if we go to the next slide then, um, this is why benefits planning is important or why we feel that benefits planning is important. Cash and associated medical insurance are valuable resources for individuals. It ensures financial and medical stability for individuals. And often, especially the Medicaid or the medical insurance often gives them access to additional services, such as services through particular Medicaid waivers. And so if individuals are receiving services through like a comprehensive DD waiver or an adult day waiver or something like that, or even the A&D waiver, um, then those services are often like essential life services and they couldn't live or work without those services. So it's really important to kind of maintain or know what the options for continued eligibility are. And so that's one of the primary reasons that benefits planning is important and so that individuals can truly make informed choices about work, how much they're going to work, all of those kinds of things, and know that they have options um, for continued services and what the true implications of that work will be. And then also, as pretty much with anything, early intervention and education is 
extremely helpful <laughs> in just about any case, not just with benefits planning, but with just about everything in life, it seems like. So we want to get people information, hopefully before um, they're working or before they experience any negative implications from that work effort so that they can prepare and plan for what changes may or may not happen and have a really good understanding of what should or should not change. Um, and we just want to help people avoid things like overpayments, underpayments, as I mentioned earlier, that crisis decision making, um, incorrect eligibility determinations. Believe it or not, you know, individuals do receive notices from Social Security, from Health and Human Services, from just about any agency that may not be accurate or maybe they made a mistake um, in determining eligibility. And so we just wanna be available, benefits planners, um, such as those of us at Easter Seals um, can be available to help people sort of navigate all that and just understand the letters that come out. Um, many of you have probably seen letters from those agencies, but if not, um, they're not always the, they're not always the nicest, they're kind of scary. And sometimes they're really long, and so they say something really scary in like the first two sentences, and then it's really hard to understand the eight pages that come after that. Um, and so it can be really helpful to have somebody sort of interpret <laughs> that, those notices and things for you, um, if that's something that people are interested in, in having assistance with. Um, okay, so, that's benefits planning. Um, again, in a nutshell, there's lots of things that benefits planners can help with and we can talk more about that later, but um, let's go ahead and go on to the next slide since we've had some questions already about the work incentives and how that those work. So first, we'll talk about SSI. The SSI program, as I said, is um, primarily for individuals who are young or for whatever reason don't have a work history. That's why it comes in for children and then a lot of those younger adults, but even older adults if they haven't had a chance to work or for whatever reason, some people have worked their whole life, but maybe they didn't pay into Social Security. Maybe they paid into some other type of retirement account um, or something like that. Where we see this sometimes is Nebraska is a very rural state. And so we have a lot of agricultural workers, sometimes family farms, where one person in the family may be paid and pays into Social Security, but maybe a spouse does not. Doesn't mean they've never worked on the farm or they don't do anything on the farm, but maybe they were never a paid employee and never paid into Social Security. So there's lots of different reasons why somebody would be eligible for SSI. But for this group, specifically those younger individuals who maybe, you know, haven't had a chance to work or just haven't worked enough to be insured in the trust fund. So SSI is that needs-based program. It's intended to provide just really basic needs. It's intended to provide food and shelter. And that's pretty much it, which is maybe why the amount that a person can receive is so low. The maximum amount for 2020 or the federal benefit rate is $783 a month. So that means that a single individual cannot receive more than $783 in a month from SSI. If they have any other type of income um, counted into their budget, then that SSI simply gets reduced based on the amount of other income that they have. And if you're an eligible couple, so in other words, two members of a couple, are both considered both eligible for SSI. If you're a married couple, you can only be eligible for a total of $1,175. So not double 783. <laughs> I guess they figure if you're living together and you're married, then you're not gonna, you're only gonna be paying essentially one amount of rent, um, utilities, um, and things like that. So it's only $1,175 for an individual. So, or for a couple, excuse me. So if someone is SSI eligible on their own and they get married, it could very likely um, have an effect on the amount of SSI that they receive. Or if two SSI eligible individuals get married, then the max that they can receive is $1,175 $1 a month. The resource um, limit, 
I've got a question here yes. regarding um, uh, the, the benefits. Um, based on what you're hearing currently, is there any way you think SSI benefits may increase um, as $783 barely covers rent? Um, I would say no. <laughs> if I had to make an educated guess, um, there are some states, depending on the cost of living, that actually have a state supplement to go along with the SSI payment, but Nebraska is not one of those states. Um, and then in the 20 years that I've been doing this work, we've never had a state supplement to supplement the SSI payment. We've always just been a state where individuals can receive the maximum um, of the federal benefit rate. So it is very difficult um, in many areas in Nebraska actually to provide for food and shelter on $783 a month. Um, so often you're looking at either um, people applying for housing assistance to reduce their housing costs or maybe having a roommate or something like that so that they can um, make it more easily, I guess, <laughs> um, on $783 a month. But honestly, one of the best ways to supplement your um, $783 or an SSI cash payment at all is if people have the ability to work. And I'll show you why that's true. Because you can actually, people can make a lot more money working than just collecting SSI. And then you have a lot more sort of freedom with your money to pay a little bit more in rent or, you know, go to a movie or, you know, do some of those kinds of things that, um, that people like to do. But you do still have to maintain the $2,000 resource limit for a single individual or the $3,000 resource limit for a couple. And at the end, I didn't include it in the slides, but I know last year when we did this presentation, we had some discussion about ABLE accounts or different ways that people can um, utilize their money or save some money and not have it count against um, the resource limit for SSI and Medicaid. So I will talk just briefly about that um, at the end. But essentially, people cannot have more than $2,000 in any combination of accounts. So you can't have $2,000 in a savings account and $2,000 in a checking account. It's $2,000 between all of your accounts. And SSI does check that monthly. So if you haven't already, you know, been made aware of that, they do check that monthly, usually at the beginning of every month. And you will get a notice if they find that your accounts have more than that amount in there. So, okay. Um, I have just a general question here. Um, if, if our family income is too high, um, do we apply at age 17 or do we wait until 18? You actually would apply at age 18. Um, they wouldn't consider, they, SSI, um, really only has, there's a number of variables that go into how quickly they have to process applications. They have certain time frames for getting certain things done and things like that. So they really wouldn't want you applying like six months ahead of time or anything like that um, because they wouldn't be able to make those eligibility determinations. And really in the light of the situation now, um, I would suggest probably contacting your local social security office I know Josette had provided the kind of the national number there for Social Security. Um, I usually suggest that people contact their local office and you can actually easily find a number for your local office. It's going to be an 800 number, um, but you can find that on the Social Security website um, by searching their office locator just by putting in your zip code. Um, and maybe asking them like how far in advance they're scheduling appointments and things like that, depending on if you want to apply online um, or if you can apply online, but it would be probably much closer um, to the, to your 18th birthday, the 18th birthday. And then just one, one more question that I'll let you continue. No, <laughs> I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll quit interrupting. No, no, um, when you talk about the Easter Seals partner agencies, is this a term used generally or is there a special relationship relationship between partner and Easter Seals? It depends. 
Um, that's my response to a lot of questions. It depends. Um, so we actually have um, contracts or grants with particular agencies. So we have um, direct formal relationships, if you will, I guess, with the Social Security Administration, with Nebraska VR. Um, we do have a grant, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit, for what we call our bridge program, which is specifically working with um, transition age youth, age 14 to 24. Um, so we do have some very formal and direct um, partners where they're, you know, through grants and, and different things. Um, but we work with a lot of partner agencies, if you will, in general. We work a lot with PTI. I know, I think Holly was on here <laughs> um, chatting in the box. Um, so we work collaboratively, if you will, with a lot of partner agencies, depending on the program. We work a lot with PTI. We work a lot with Monroe Meyer Institute. We work a lot with um, the Centers for Independent Living. We work a lot with um, you know, Community Alliance, which is mental health rehab um, in the Omaha and surrounding area. So, and that's just a snapshot. <laughs> um, we do um, employment services as well. And so we partner a lot with workforce development agencies and Nebraska Department of Labor and just lots of different partners. So um, I guess I use that term very generally, but it means different things, I guess, depending on the circumstances. So. Hopefully that answers their question. Um, all right, so with SSI then, just talking a little bit more detail about that, once someone is eligible for SSI and they're thinking about work and they, you know, depending on the amount that they get, maybe they get the full $783, but they're thinking about work and they'd like to supplement that, there are several work incentives that may apply to their situation, which actually can make it very beneficial for a person to be working. Not just all of the personal um, growth and things that go along with it, or the self-esteem, all of those kinds of things, but it can also be very financially beneficial for someone to be working instead of just receiving SSI. So, I'm not necessarily going to talk about each one of these in detail. Um, if you do have questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat box. Jennifer's good, doing a good job of keeping me up with that, but um, I'll answer questions about them specifically. But just to give you an idea, there are such things as an earned income exclusion. There's impairment-related work expenses. There's something called a plan to achieve self-support. There's a student earned income exclusion, there are blind work expenses, and then we will talk a little bit more about Medicaid continuation um, and expedited reinstatement of benefits. But just know that even though a person's SSI check may be adjusted based on how much they're working, there are lots of work incentives that can actually reduce the amount of earnings that SSI counts, which means you can actually still keep a good portion of your SSI sometimes um, and be working. And sometimes you can even keep all of your SSI and be working. So again, just thinking about the audience and there may be individuals out there who have older um, children or older people that they're thinking about, but the student earned income exclusion is a big one. So essentially for individuals who are still in school, whether it be secondary school or post-secondary school, if they are under the age of 22 and not married, they can exclude up to, and of course I didn't put the numbers in here, but it's up to almost $1,800 a month in earnings before SSI would count anything. And that's up to, Again, I should have put the exact numbers in here, but I didn't. Um, almost, it's like $7,900 a year um, in total earnings. So essentially someone can work that much while they're a student and not have it affect their SSI at all. So whether they're working part-time during the school year and then more hours during the summer, or they're just working a little bit, maybe they don't work during the school year, but they do work in the summer, whatever the case may be, even during those summer hours, as long as they're enrolled for the fall semester, they can still qualify for the student earned income exclusion. 
that is pretty huge. So kids can earn a lot of money, not have it affect their SSI at all. Um, so those are some of the kinds of things that it's important to know about and just know how to establish those kinds of things with Social Security. Um, believe it or not, some of these are fairly easy <laughs> to establish with Social Security. Not everything is that easy with Social Security. It's not necessarily easy to get eligible. Um, it's not necessarily easy to stay eligible sometimes, but some of these kinds of things, um, there's help out there to assist you in getting some of these things done. Um, and I know our friends at PTI and some other places are familiar with these kinds of things too and can help people as well. So, okay, let's go to the next slide. So SSI and Medicaid. As I mentioned before, um, it's not necessarily just the cash payments. The cash payments are super helpful and can help with financial stability and everything. But oftentimes it's more the health insurance or the Medicaid piece that sometimes is the tie to those additional services that I mentioned. So once someone gets eligible for SSI and then applies for Medicaid, you actually have to apply for Medicaid in Nebraska. It's not an automatic eligibility, even if you're SSI eligible. You will be eligible, but you do have to apply. And then that can be your tie to any of those Medicaid waiver services. So like the developmental disability services that you hear about, or the personal assistance services through like the aged and disabled waiver, some of those kinds of things. So Medicaid can sometimes be even more important than that cash payment, okay? All right, next slide. So therefore, it would be important for people to know if they can continue their Medicaid while they're working, right? So I just briefly mentioned this earlier, um, that your SSI payment, because they do look at other income when determining your benefit amount. Um, and I talk with my hands, sorry, you can see I'm waving in the video there. Um, and I usually move around a lot more, so sitting still is very difficult for me. Um, but anyway, so once someone is eligible for an SSI cash payment and they start working, their work can actually affect the amount of SSI that they get. It doesn't necessarily take it all away. It just may be adjusted based on how much they're actually earning. And SSI actually counts a little bit less than half of what you're earning. So therefore, you can make a whole lot more money working than you can just collecting SSI. And even if somebody works enough that their SSI cash payment is reduced to zero, they can still be eligible for Medicaid through the 1619B provision, which is what specifically allows SSI individuals to continue Medicaid, even if work reduces their cash payment to zero. Individuals in 2020 can actually earn up to $40,298 a year and still continue Medicaid eligibility. That means they can maintain their eligibility for their waiver services or any other medical expenses and things like that that they need to live, to work, and to do anything else. Um, so that is super important because people often think that they're very limited on how much they can earn and still continue Medicaid. But for SSI folks, they can actually earn a lot of money and still continue those absolutely necessary services and eligibility for those critical um, benefits. Um, so that's pretty huge. They do still have the applicable resource limits. So you still can only have $2,000 in any combination of accounts or $3,000 if you're a couple. So it's important to maintain that. Um, but you can work a lot and earn a lot and still keep those, keep those benefits. And then there's just one uh, point down there at the bottom that says in some cases, individuals can actually earn more than the state threshold. And that is true. SSI can actually establish individualized threshold amounts for individuals who have medical expenses that exceed that state threshold amount. Um, so we've worked with individuals who actually have threshold amounts of more like 50, 60, $70,000 in a year. Okay. Um, so I have a question here. Is, yes, is it Medicaid eligibility automatic? 
Oh, is Medicaid eligibility automatically done in other states if someone is SSI eligible? Do you know? Um, in some states, yes, but not every state. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't know how many states um, are automatic, but it seems like every state does things a little bit different. Some states, they actually, there's monetary exchanges between Social Security and whatever department administers, excuse me, their Medicaid coverage. Um, <clears throat> and so there's communication between those agencies and things like that. So it's more of an automatic thing. Nebraska, again, in the 20 years that I've been doing this, has never been that kind of state. Um, and so, and trying to get anybody one agency or the other to pay for services or to pay for that collaboration is probably not extremely likely. Um, so it's basically a formality, like the person will be eligible um, in Nebraska, but they do have to apply. Does that answer the question, hopefully? Okay, all right. So if we talk a little bit more now about the um, Title II side of things or the Social Security Disability side of things. I just don't want to leave this part out. I know that a lot of younger individuals are SSI eligible, but there are situations where someone who is fairly young either may become eligible, even right at 18, they may become eligible for a benefit off of their parents' record, which is actually a Social Security Disability benefit, or those younger folks who are working they, they really don't have to work very much before becoming eligible or for very long before possibly becoming eligible for a benefit off of their own work record. So you will see younger individuals, you know, 20, 21, those younger um, 20s folks who may um, be SSI eligible and then suddenly they're getting a notice saying, hey, you need to apply for social security disability because we've noticed that you might be eligible for a benefit off of your work record. And SSI will require people to apply for any other benefits for which they might be eligible because again, SSI is that pair of last resort. So they want people to receive other monies first before they would get an SSI cash payment. And so there are a number of situations where individuals may receive a SSDI benefit or a social security disability benefit instead of an SSI benefit, or they may receive a little bit of both. Sometimes if their social security disability benefit is less than that $783 a month, they might receive an SSDI benefit and then also get a supplement from SSI. Um, so that's why I think it's kind of important just to know that there are these bent types of benefits as well. And if someone is eligible for a social security disability type benefit, whether it's off of their own record or off of a parent's record, then they sort of look at phases of work incentives um, and different things that may apply during those phases of employment. So again, not to go into too much detail about them, but just so people know, there is such a thing as a trial work period. It's a period, just what it sounds like, a period of time for people to go to work, try it out, see how it goes. Then after there's an extended period of eligibility, and that, I guess I should say, the trial work period is essentially about nine months, but maybe not nine consecutive months. The extended period of eligibility is 36 consecutive months. Um, and then, uh, so that's about four years, essentially, of safety nets. And then after that, there's a period of time where people can get back on benefits if they've worked over a certain level. And if, if you're not confused already, <laughs> I can tell you that navigating these systems can be very confusing, especially if people do get more than one benefit or through any of those transitions from one benefit to another. There's special rules that apply um, if people are SSI eligible and then become eligible for a benefit off of a parent's record as far as their continued eligibility for Medicaid. So nothing is ever simple, even though we try somewhat to simplify it so that it sort of makes sense here. Um, there's all kinds of special rules and special circumstances that can affect one thing or another or how a rule applies to one person or another. 
which was why we always recommend that people get individualized services and know exactly what your situation is um, and just know that it can change um, from time to time. So at any of those different transition periods, it's often helpful to kind of get current updated information about your situation. Okay. All right, next slide. So finally, getting back to the question about those SGA amounts, um, sorry that it took so long, but um, if you look at this slide or if you can see this slide, when we talk about substantial gainful activity, again, we're talking about sort of a specific earnings amount that Social Security looks at to determine medical eligibility in the beginning. And then for these Title II benefits or the Social Security Disability benefits, they look at these amounts for ongoing. And as mentioned on the slide here, it looks like it'd be pretty cut and dry amount, right? But again, nothing is ever simple. So this is sort of a guideline that Social Security looks at, and it's $1,260 a month for um, anybody who is working and anybody who is non-blind. If somebody is considered statutorily blind, as Josette mentioned earlier, that SGA amount is $2,110 per month in 2020, okay? All right, next slide. But again, it's a guideline, so it's not necessarily um, a strict amount, if you will, or it's not necessarily a strict amount. So these are some of the work incentives, and again, there's not a lot of detail about any of these, um, but we do discuss them more specifically with individuals as they apply. But there's such things as subsidy, which is basically um, if somebody is working, but maybe they get help on the job, um, something like that, then Social Security may disregard a portion of their earnings. There's such a thing as unsuccessful work attempt if they weren't able to maintain a level of work. Um, income averaging, and again, impairment-related work expenses. And these are all things that can reduce the amount of income or the amount of earnings that Social Security looks at when they're trying to determine if the person is actually working at this SGA level or not. Um, and so there are times when people can actually earn more than $1,260 a month and still remain eligible for their Social Security Disability cash payments. Okay, all right, next slide. Social Security Disability comes with Medicare, as we mentioned earlier, after a 24-month waiting period. Even if somebody goes um, to work before 24 months, before they've been re-entitled to benefits for 24 months, they will still become eligible for Medicare. So even if you are working, you get Social Security Disability benefits, and then you start working before 24 months, you're still going to become eligible for Medicare. And then if you go to the next slide, you'll see that somebody can actually still be eligible for Medicaid as well. So even for Social Security Disability beneficiaries, there are ways to qualify for Medicaid um, or medical assistance even if you're eligible for Medicare. So sometimes people will receive a whole combination of things. They may receive Social Security Disability and SSI. They may also receive Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and then you throw in sometimes parents' <laughs> insurance and things like that. So again, it can just get really complex really quickly sometimes, um, but they're all situations that can be navigated. Um, but Again, we want people to know that even if you don't have SSI, you may be eligible for Medicaid, or if your SSI eligibility changes and maybe you become eligible for a benefit off of a parent's record or off of your own, there are ways that somebody can maintain their Medicaid eligibility and also their services, their developmental disability services or any other such waiver services that they need. Um, you might hear terms like spend down or share of cost, whether it's a medical share of cost or a services share of cost. Um, you may hear Medicaid insurance for workers with disabilities, which we're working hard to improve. 
Um, but there are ways that people can work and still qualify for Medicaid, regardless of what type of benefit that they get. All right, next slide. Um, we have yes. a very specific application question. Um, uh, so I've heard differences of when we can apply for SSI. Um, is it the first day of the month in which the individual turns 18, the first day of the month after they turn 18, or is it on the actual birthday? Anybody know? Josette, maybe? I was going to say, Josette, do you know an answer to that one? I don't know specifically. That is a really good question. Um, I suppose you could do it the month of their 18th birthday. It does take them a while to process your application. They may hang on to it a little while knowing that that child is going to turn 18. So the, the application is going to be different. Um, it probably, like Shauna had mentioned, like once they turn 18, that would probably be the the best time to apply because their application is going to be different than a child's application. So, I mean, you could start the process two weeks ahead of time, but I don't think it really makes that big of difference. Okay, we've got another you know, application. Can I just ask a question real quick here? Sorry. So, I know, um, is it once you start the application process, I know that there's something, if it takes several months to get that is it retroactive back to the, the date that the child be turned 18 or is it back to when the application was filed well there's such a thing as a protected filing date so say if you call if you call the social security office and you um say that you want to apply for ssi then essentially the day that you schedule the day that you called is a is sort of your protected filing date but they may not, depending on if you're applying, you know, in person or some of those kinds of things, um, you may not actually apply on that date, but you would have that protected filing date so that they could make it retroactive to the first point possible. There are some um, specific considerations as far as when they determine a person's eligibility or date of onset. So if your date of onset is determined to be you know, the first or second of a month, then you may be eligible for that month, um, but maybe not if your onset is later in the month. Um, so I think that applying for SSI benefits like in the month of the birthday is fine because that's potentially the first month of eligibility. Um, but whether or not you would actually be able to apply like on the first of the month um, might depend on how you're applying. <laughs> Um, and whether or not they have any, um, and whether or not there's any control over the date of that actual application, if that makes sense. Um, so I guess, you know, again, I would go back to, it might be best to call um, the local office and find out what your application options are if you can apply in person. Um, which you can't right now, obviously, but just generally speaking, um, or if you can apply online, not everybody can apply online, but there are more cases that can apply online now. Um, and just ask that local office for guidance. Um, and then hopefully that will help make a determination and you'll be able to get the right um, filing date so that people can get the benefits as early as possible. And um, since I can see <laughs> Holly popping up here um, in the chat box, PTA is really good about helping people sort of navigate um, those application processes um, and deadlines and things like that. And I guess I didn't, um, I thought I had a slide in here that had um, the contact information, but somehow I must have deleted it, I guess, um, for myself and for Sean Newell. Um, oh, it is here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so Sean Newell also is very familiar. She's um, kind of the lead of our bridge program at Easter Seals, Nebraska. And she works a lot with PTI and, you know, as I said, some of these other sort of collaborating partners. Um, 
but she's available. She can be available to help answer some of those more specific questions, especially regarding like those transition age youth cases. Um, she can actually help people um, through that application process um, and help people track information and what needs to be reported and when it needs to be reported. I know that she's worked a lot with um, PTI and they both have some different resources as far as tracking tools and things like that. Um, we've sort of shared some of those. <laughs> we share each other's documents um, and things like that just to help people, families have the best information possible. So the number that's on this slide is actually Sean's direct number. Um, so if there are questions um, sort of about those services or how Easter Seals or, or, or other agencies might be able to help, um, Sean would be a good resource um, and be able to help answer some of those questions more specifically. Um. Another question here, are you able to work with individuals or families um, who are in Iowa or who are from Iowa? Um, yes. um, so it kind of depends again on the, um, on the program or, or who's actually, what kind of services they're needing. Um, it's sort of a, interesting situation sometimes because Council Bluffs and some of those um, like southwestern Iowa counties are so close um, to Nebraska, but some of the services are um, sort of specific to certain areas depending on um, what program it is and everything. For instance, our, our bridge program, our funder is very um, sort of elected very specific counties um, that could be served. Um, but our other programs are statewide um, in Nebraska. But then there are some situations, for instance, um, like I most specifically work in our Ticket to Work program. Um, and we are a national employment network. So we can actually work with individuals anywhere in the United States. So we work with individuals in Iowa or other states um, and sort of help them. Um, if you don't know, I guess I didn't specify, like the Ticket to Work program is for adults. So essentially anyone who's 18 and over um, who receives social security disability or SSI benefits and wants to work. And we can work with individuals who are also working with other agencies. So again, that's where a lot of that um, collaboration and partnership um, comes in um, and provide benefits, planning services, and some employment services and, and things like that. So um, I don't know if that answers their question, but I would say always, um, always call and let us know what kind of services you're looking for or how we might be able to help. And we're happy to help, you know, however we can, even if it's just helping you if it's something that we're not able to do for you, um, we may be able to help connect you to a resource in your area that would be able to help you. So just always call. <laughs> um, two questions came in. Um, can you describe what the bridge program is? Um, so I might have done that a little bit already, but maybe not. So Bridge is um, basically a program that Easter Seals has in um, coordination with the Carnap Foundation through the United Way. And so really what we're doing is working with individuals and families who are age 14 to 24, so essentially that transition age youth group. They, it's more directed towards individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities, but almost any type of disability can qualify. <laughs> so we sort of broadened it as much as we possibly could. It may be some type of learning disability. It may be like your ADHD. It may be um, something more physically related than that. Um, but what we're trying to do is provide whatever services are needed to help individuals and families sort of navigate those early transition years. So whether it's, you know, having some discussion about like 504 plans or IEPs in school or 
um, connecting them to other resources that might know more about that. Like, you know, again, that's where we're collaborating with PTI and other agencies. Um, if it is trying to help determine should you apply for SSI for your child? When should you apply for SSI? How do you apply? And actually walking you through that application process and even in helping as much as possible. Um, again, same with like developmental disability services. Have you already applied? Do you need to apply? When should you apply? Um, all of those kinds of things. And so it's really just um, helping navigate, you know, those different systems, connecting individuals and families or parents to different resources that may be helpful. And again, even providing like um, tracking tools or different resource manuals and things like that to help them understand what do I need to get keep track of. If they're not eligible for SSI as a child, then what do I need to keep track of while they are a child so that I can be prepared to apply them at age 18 on their own? You know, just some of those different kinds of things. Um, so again, it may be even more than that, but hopefully that's <laughs> a good enough description to answer your question. Um, is there a waiting list in order um, to assist individuals? Um, no, not really. So uh, I guess it kind of depends on the program. Um, really the only um, place I would say we have sort of a waiting list is um, if somebody, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a contract with um, the Social Security Administration, one of our contracts with the Social Security Administration. It's called the Work Incentives Planning and Assistance Project. So that is money that is provided um, to different agencies um, in the United States to provide those benefits planning services um, and help people understand the work incentives and things that are available. But that's sort of, we, we sort of use that as our fallback program because we do have so many direct partnerships um, where we can serve people like through the Ticket to Work program so they can be participating with us. We provide those services directly to individuals. Our partnership with Nebraska VR or some of those other agencies, um, we have the Bridge program. So essentially that WIPA project is really less than two full-time staff um, to serve the entire state of Nebraska. Um, and really any social security disability or SSI beneficiary age 14 to 64. <laughs> so you can see that when there's less than two people that are responsible for, I think there's right around 62,000 social security disability and SSI beneficiaries in that working age group, 18 to 64 in Nebraska. Um, so if you have less than two people to serve potentially 62,000 people, that's probably not going <laughs> to work out so well. Um, so we try to get people into the, some of those other programs where there really isn't a waiting list um, and use that WIPA project as, as sort of the fallback because they are very busy. So. Okay, and then just another question on the bridge program. Um, does that program um, only support those in Omaha, in the Omaha area, or is that statewide? The bridge, um, okay, so the bridge program itself is not statewide. It is, um, I think, it's Douglas and Sarpy County, and then Dodge, Washington, and Cass County, I believe, um, are the counties that can be served through bridge. But we do have other um, programs, I guess, if you will, um, that may be able to provide services to individuals in that transition age group, um, especially if they're 18 or older. Um, but even that 14 to 18 group, um, we're happy to try and answer questions um, as best we can and provide guidance. Um, but essentially we have somewhere for everybody to fit and receive services um, wherever they are in Nebraska. Okay, I, I think that I got all of the questions that were in the chat box at this point. Okay. Well, hopefully that gives everybody some <laughs> 
at least a basic understanding. I know it's kind of a lot, um, even though we tried to keep it um, simple. So I guess I would just encourage people, you know, to reach out if you do have follow-up questions, especially after trying to absorb all this, you know, <laughs> information in sort of one sitting. Um, it's a lot to try to take in. So if you think of questions later or anything like that, um, please reach out to Sean or myself um, or, or somebody from Monroe Myers or, you know, that we try to stay connected and, and keep in touch with each other and get people to connected to the right resources. Um, but we're happy to answer any questions that we can, so. Okay, thank you so much, Shauna, for taking some time out of your evening tonight. As, um, and Josette as well, thank you very, very much um, for coming and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, for the participants, I do have just a quick poll um, that just kind of gives some feedback for the presentation and um, how helpful this was for you. So if you wouldn't mind just going ahead and taking a couple of minutes to um, go ahead and complete that, that would be very, very helpful for us. Um, and thank you to all the participants as well for your wonderful questions and spending some time with us this evening, um, you know, and, and hopefully we were able to get those questions answered for you.